So anemia, next best step is calculate reticulite locite count or MCV. Helps you narrow down your differential. Increased reticulocyte count would be like 2% or more. That means that the baby red blood cells are being pushed out like crazy to replenish the blood cells that have been dying. So that either indicates hemolysis or like splenic sequestration. And then the MCV can help you decide whether it's microcytic, normocytic, or macrocytic. The microcytics would be like fast, right? Iron deficiency anemia, anemia of chronic disease, sideroblastic anemia, or thalassemia. The normocytics is, there's a lot of differentials for that. And then the macrocytics could be uh, most commonly folate deficiency or B12 deficiency, cyanocobalamin deficiency. And to tell the difference between the two, well, B12 usually has neurologic problems uh, called subacute combined degeneration, which is a problem of the dorsal colon and the upper motor neurons, the corticospinal tract. On top of that, blood markers, B12 will have an increased methylmalonic acid, whereas B9 doesn't. And then other causes of, uh, but then this is mac megaloblastic anemia, right? So that means macrocytic anemia plus hypersegmented neutrophils, whereas macrocytic anemias, not necessarily megaloblastic, will have an MCV of greater than 100. Red, the red blood cell MCV is greater than 100, but they don't have hypersegmented neutrophils. And the most common ones would be alcoholics. Or some two more zebra ones would be Fanconi's anemia and diamond black fan anemia. So Fanconi's anemia is the one where you have a hypoplastic thumb and pancytopenia, whereas diamond black fan anemia is the triphalangeal thumb with just anemia. <clears throat> uh, so the next thing is red blood cell transfusions. I want you to remember uh, timing here. Timing here is critical. So 30 seconds, 30 minutes, 3 hours, 3 days. If a red blood cell transfusion ha problem happens within 30 seconds, it's anaphylaxis and this is due to an IgA deficiency. How you d prevent this is by washing the blood. The next is 30 minutes. This is ABO incompatibility. This is an acute hemolytic reaction. The signs I want you to look for that make it different than the others is hypotension and flank pain. You treat this with IV fluids. At three hours, this is where you get a febrile um, reaction, and this is due to cytokine release, and you prevent this with leukoreduction. And then three days later is where you get the delayed hemolytic reaction. This causes jaundice a few days later and the treatment is itself limited, so just let it pass. So timing is clutch for the red blood cell transfusions and obviously it can vary a little bit, but it's generally like plus or minus, like within that range. You wanna think in terms of seconds, minutes, hours, days. So other key things here is um, a high red cell distribution width is really helpful in the microcytic anemias because a high RDW plus some microcytic anemia is most likely iron deficiency anemia, whereas the other microcytic anemias don't do that, like thalassemia will have a uh, normal RDW. Another one that's help helpful is high MCHC is usually associated with hereditary spherocytosis. Remember, that's the uh, congenital red blood cell disease where you have the missing ancrin and spectrin, which uh, prevents the red blood cell from keeping the normal biconcave shape, and then it makes the spherocytes. And then these can get lodged in the spleen and uh, and you can treat that with a splenectomy. Beta thalassemia is associated with Mediterranean populations. You'll see the crew cut skull on x-ray and it has an elevate, elevated hemoglobin A2, whereas alpha thalassemia is associated with Asians and this will also have a microcytic anemia as well. So in these thalassemia vignettes, look for uh, race being introduced into the vignettes. Remember, sideroblastic anemia versus hemochromatosis. They can have very similar iron studies. So the difference is that 
So sideroblastic, so they both have high ferritin, high serum iron, and low TIBC, but sideroblastic anemia is basically iron in the red blood cells bursting out of the RBCs. So this is caused by B6 deficiency or lead poisoning or isoniazide, which prevents the incorporation of iron into the hemoglobin. And then versus hemochromatosis, which is uh, um, autosomal dominant, caused, caused by excessive iron absorption through the gut. And then this is actually iron, so much iron that it starts out in the red, uh, in the circulatory system and then ends up flooding into the red blood cells as well. And then these both have similar markers. <clears throat> but the kicker is that hemochromatosis will also have the additional symptoms of iron overload such as bronze diabetes and elevated LFTs. Remember hemochromatosis is treated with phlebotomy which helps remove the excess iron. Anemia of chronic disease can be a normocytic anemia or a microcytic anemia and this is due to any type of chronic disease or inflammation and when this happens the Cytokines will suppress erythropoiesis and also lock in the precious iron in the red blood cells and all the other, the rest of the human cells to basically hide it away from potential bacteria. And this person will have high ferritin, uh, low serum iron, and low TIBC. Remember, most of the time, ferritin and TIBC. TIBC is also known as transferrin. They usually are opposite. So if ferritin is high, TIBC will be low. For example, let's try iron deficiency anemia, right? So iron deficiency anemia and ferritin is a reflection of iron within the cells. So say iron deficiency anemia, you don't have iron anywhere in the body. So ferritin will be low, right? Transferrin or TIBC will be high. And then the third one you have to think about is serum iron. Since it's iron deficient, then serum iron will be low. And then, yeah, and it kind of just works like that. And then remember, anemia of chronic disease is treated by treating the underlying disease. So if someone with rheumatoid arthritis has anemia of chronic disease, right? So high ferritin, low serum iron, uh, low transferrin. What's the best next treatment? A, B, C, uh, methotrexate, D, E. Well, it's methotrexate. Why? Because you're treating the underlying disease. And remember key uh, terminology differences. Aplastic crisis and aplastic anemia are not the same thing. Aplastic crisis is red blood cells only, whereas aplastic anemia is kind of a misnomer. It's actually a pancytopenia. What can cause aplastic crisis? It's a virus. It starts with the P. It ends with the arvo, parvovirus. Parvovirus in the mom can cause this problem in the fetus. The answer is hydrops fatalis. So. Spherocytes, you'll see in two cases, hereditary spherocytosis or autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And the reason why in autoimmune hemolytic anemia you get spherocytes is because the antibodies will pluck off membrane blebs and then that will uh, basically diminish the uh, redundant plasma membrane and then instead of having enough plasma membrane to make a biconcave disc it now just becomes a round shape and then remember autoimmune hemolytic anemia you have two types warm and cold so warm is great great stands for igg so this is an igg antibody against the red blood cells and the main ones are lukewarm l stands for leukemias lymphomas, and lupus. These can cause warm autoimmune hemolytic anemias. This causes splenic sequestration, and so you'll have splenomegaly and warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia, and you treat this by treating with steroids. And then cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia is cold is miserable, 
M stands for IgM, so this is an IgM antibody against the red blood cells. And M also stands for mycoplasma or mono. And you get hepatomegaly in this case, and you treat this with avoiding the cold. So TTP is thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. This is due to uh, excess von Willebrand's factor. So you need to remember, remember Adams TS13? It's a protease that block, that breaks down, that basically cleaves von Willebrand factor and makes it inactive. When you have a lack of this, now von Willebrand factor is just, way, there's way too much of it everywhere. And remember, von Willebrand factor uh, is attaches to GP1B, which is part of the platelet that uh, causes platelet adhesion. So it allows for the platelet to stick to the endothelium. And then, so all, you'll have excessive uh, platelet adhesion, and then these will all clump up. And then when the red blood cells swim by, there's all these uh, like speed bumps everywhere but in a very narrow pipe, and then the red blood cells will shear. This is called a schistocyte, but by shearing, they also hemolyze, and so that's anemia, hemolytic anemia. So then you'll have thrombocytopenia due to the platelet consumption and hemolytic anemia. So that's thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura, but it also causes fever, and renal problems and encephalopathy. So there's a mnemonic which is fat RN, fever, anemia, thrombocytopenia, renal problems, and neuro problems. And then a variation of this is called hemolytic uremic syndrome, which is caused by EHEC. EHEC is a type of E. coli, enterohemorrhagic E. coli, which is caused by eating undercooked burgers burger patties, and that can also cause a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, which is a fancy word of saying what I just described earlier with the thrombo, the platelet clumping, and the schistocytes. <clears throat> and uh, that is anemia, thrombocytopenia, and renal problems. And remember, that is one of the manifestations of uremia, so you want to treat that with dialysis. And then there is HIT, which is heparin induced thrombocytopenia. So sometimes you can, this patient will have an antiplatelet factor for antibody. And uh, because of this, when you give them heparin, then what will happen is that these antibodies will start taking out your platelets. So the vignette will be a person who has taken heparin and they'll show you day one labs and it'll be like 150,000 platelets. And on day seven, now they have 80,000 platelets. What to do next? The classic question. And the classic answer is stop heparin and start dabigatron or argotroban, which are direct thrombin inhibitors. And remember that even though they have thrombocytopenia, these platelets clump up so they become pro-thrombotic, so they're at increased risk for DVT and PEs. You can also diagnose HIT with a serotonin release assay. Next is von Willebrand's disease. Von Willebrand's disease is due to a deficiency of von Willebrand or non-functioning von Willebrand factor, and you will see a reduced Ristocetin activity, which means, well, Ristocetin is a, a lab test that induces von Willebrand factor from binding to glycoprotein 1B uh, on the platelets, and that will cause coagulation. But if someone has von Willebrand's disease, then the von Willebrand factor won't bind to the GP1B, and this will not coagulate. So if it doesn't coagulate, then that's a diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease. Also, remember von Willebrand factor uh, carries factor eight with it, so you will see an elevated bleeding time and elevated PTT. Why? Because PTT uh, helps uh, 
PTT as a measure of the intrinsic fa factor, uh, the intrinsic pathway, which factor eight belongs to. Remember, factor 12, 11, 9, 8, and 10 are intrinsic, and extrinsic is factor seven. The extrinsic pathway is measured by warfarin, which includes factor seven. And then, and then bleeding time is a measure of platelet uh, activity. So since there's no von Willebrand factor, then the platelets don't stick, so ble bleeding time will be elevated. So a patient with von Willebrand disease will have elevated PTT, elevated BT, uh, ristocetin assay that is has no activity, no clumping, and si and clinical signs. It will be usually a person who has epistaxis with gingival bleeding and menorrhagia. For some reason, a lot of these questions, it's in a female. And uh, you can treat this by desmopressin. Desmopressin, remember, is a synthetic vasopressin, aka ADH. And ADH not only works on the kidneys, but it works on the endothelial cells too, which helps promote the release of von Willebrand factor. Last is DIC. DIC is the most extreme version of a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And so you'll have the thrombocytopenia from clumping, consumption of that with the schistocyte hemolysis. So you get anemia with that too. But on top of that, what makes it different, different than TTP and HUS is that it also consumes coagulation factors. So then this person will also have elevated PT, elevated at PTT as well. So all their coagulation timing markers will be increased. And then um, DIC patients will also be spontaneously bleeding from different sites like IV access sites, and they might also be in shock. Oncologic emergencies are hypercalcemia, treat with IV fluids. Spinal cord compression from metastasis, treat with steroids. Cardiac tamponade, pericardiosynthesis. Tumor lysis syndrome, IV fluids. Remember Hodgkin lymphoma versus non-Hodgkin lymphoma? They can both cause B symptoms, fever, night sweats, weight loss. That can also be seen in TB. But Hodgkin versus non-Hodgkin, remember Hodgkin has the Reed-Sternberg cells, whereas non-Hodgkin does not. Hodgkin also has lymph nodes that it tends to cluster together in chains, whereas non-Hodgkin can be uh, lymph nodes that are spread out. The most common Hodgkin lymphoma is the nodular sclerosing type and the lymphocyte depleted, whereas non-Hodgkin is the ones where you will see Burkitt, follicular, and HIV lymphoma. And then any lymph node that's one centimeter plus that has that's not associated with an infection, non-painful, and has been there for an, over a month, you should biopsy it. You have uh, ALL, AML, CML, CLL, and then the acute ones are due to increased blasts, more than 20% blasts, and then the chronic ones are more the mature types that are elevated, and then the M and L designations tells you which of the blood cells are elevated, so M stands for myelogenous, so that's anything other than the lymphocytes, whereas L is lymphocyte. So myelogenous, think of like increased basophils, eosinophils, neutrophils, and then the L1 stands for lymphocytes. And then AML will have the hour rods. And then CML, remember that this one, the chronic ones tend to have more reliable blood markers. They'll have super elevated white blood cell counts but the acute leukemias will tend to have uh, pancytopenias and the blood cell counts aren't as reliable, but the chronic ones will definitely have elevated leukocyte counts. And then M, how do you know if it's CML versus CLL? Well, myelogenous, when they show you the breakdown of uh, white blood cells, like you know neutrophils, lymphocytes, monocytes, eosinophils, basophils, well, the basophil count will be super high. And remember CML, you treat it with 
uh, imatinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And usually these people will have a pretty good prognosis if they're adherent to these medications. And uh, so that's a pretty cool breakthrough. And then remember that CML will have a low lab score and a lab score is a reflection of uh, le normal leukocyte function versus polycythemia vera, which is a red blood cell cancer. So they have super elevated hemoglobin, but they might also have super elevated white blood cells and platelets too. But so anytime you see polycythemia, remember what the best next step is, is to check erythropoietin levels. Because um, if the er erythropoietin levels are low, this is polycythemia, but if it's elevated, that means this is a secondary reactive polycythemia. So certain things that can cause um, elevated hemoglobin can be like uh, causes of hypox hypoxia or hypoxemia. So um, remember erythropoietin is generated from the interstitial cells of the kidney. So if the kidney is not getting enough oxygen, for example, I don't know, any type of chronic lung disease or obstructive sleep apnea, then the uh, erythropoietin levels will go up and then try to generate more red blood cells to increase and improve oxygen delivery. Polycythemia vera is associated with the person who gets pruritus after hot showers. That's basically it for hemong.